Again, I want to thank you for being here as we move into this second of the major concepts for this lesson two of the free online course, Is God Dead? Most people who believe in God tend to think that everything that exists in the universe came from God. History itself is a result of God. But it turns out God has a starting point in history. I should really say God's. Yes, the very idea of God that many of you are holding in your heads right now. Scholars have more or less tracked down when that all started in history. So if we track backwards in history, cross-referencing the Western mythical record against the Western historical and archeological records, we have a good idea of where the idea of God comes from. At least 200,000 years ago, Homo sapiens sapiens stepped onto the archeological scene. And I say at least, these days it's more like half a million years ago, probably much older than that, but we'll go between 200,000 years ago and, and half a million years ago. Who it is that we are, some version of us stepped onto the scene. Their form of subsistence included hunting and gathering. They came to subsist in small groups, we think, as a practical issue of safety. Against the inhospitable wilderness, there was strength in numbers. But as humans and groups tend to do, some of the people started getting onto the nerves of others in the group. For the sake of the illustration, imagine this is only happening in one group, but it's likely that the pattern was happening in different places and times among different groups of humans uh, across the board. The conflict in the first group eventually leads to violence, and that violence leads to the first murder in human history. In response to this murder, some members of the one group punish the murderer and his or her family through banishment. What do you do? You've never experienced this before. Well, you kick them out. Another group then organizes around the banished family. That process continues over tens and even hundreds of thousands of years, this basic social structure leads to a world populated by bands of nomadic hunter-gatherers. Now, for the sake of the illustration, let's call each of these groups a tribe. These tribes were almost always nomadic, but they tended to stay in the same regions. They followed the rhythms of nature, and they stayed more or less in the same kind of cyclical patterns regionally. More like birds, they were probably moving in a kind of cycle, you know, following the food or the seasons. Across these millennia, different groups came to associate themselves with features of the regions where they roamed. If one tribe was always in the presence of beavers, they came to think of themselves as a beaver tribe. When another tribe was always around lions, they became the lion tribe. They didn't have to be animals, however. Some tribes could have been the Big Mountain or the Fast Creek tribe. The point is that each member of this tribe took their identity from their affiliation with the tribe, and then that tribe took its identity from its affiliation with that geographic or natural object. Now the objects, whether it's places or animals or plants that inspire the names of each of these tribes, we call a totem. As tribes come to organize themselves around their totems, the totems come to take on a transcendent quality mattering more than any one member of the group. Each totem becomes the most important aspect of social life for that tribe. In fact, the world comes to be thought of in a dichotomy by the members of that tribe. There are things in the world that work to reinforce the totem, and scholars of religion come to call these things that reinforce totems sacred things. That's what a sacred thing is for many scholars. That is, things set apart from ordinary people and society. Now, on the other hand, the things in the world that potentially take away from the totem or that threaten it, scholars come to call profane. These things could include, these things could include outsiders wanting to harm the group or insiders wanting to harm the totem. In either case, tribes would deal with profane people and objects through banishment or destruction. Supposing that many of the world's tribes operated according to this totemic principle, we can imagine that this totemism provided a kind of homeostatic existence for the tribes. They would sometimes fight internally as well as against other tribes, but so long as the totems were respected, most tribes and their members remained relatively safe and content. Now this relative social equilibrium began to change with the advent of agriculture. 
around 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. When it started depends on where you look. Agriculture brought a variety of pressures and changes to the general totemic social structure, leading ultimately to the development of city-states where people began living together in much larger groups than the tribal setting. Now, living in cities and subsisting on agriculture allowed then for what we call, in a technical way, the division of labor. This enabled the production of art and culture at a scale previously unseen in the archeological or historical record. Classically, the Western world identifies the first four civilizations that include the Egyptian, the Minoan, the Mesopotamian, and the Indus Valley civilizations. Today, we know very little about the Indus Valley or Minoan civilizations. We know a great deal, however, about ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, including about their religious beliefs and practices. In both Egypt and Mesopotamia, we see the introduction of the idea of gods to society. Here, the sacred profane binary distinction already organized totemic life for them. And in Egypt and Mesopotamia, gods would both confirm or affirm as well as complicate this sacred profane distinction. In Egypt, the first Pharaoh Menes came to unify two confederations of tribes. These were groups consisting of several different tribes that had banded together as a kind of mega tribe. We remember these confederations of tribes as Upper and Lower Egypt. Upper Egypt came to be represented by the most powerful totem among the various tribal totems within that confederation. Power could be procured through belief in the deity, effectively meaning power was held and used by worship of the totem itself. Or you might think of it this way, that power may have rested with the military commander and was then represented by whatever totem that military commander associated themselves with. Either way, totemism was transforming at this point into polytheism, the simultaneous introduction of disparate totems into a singular geographic location that constitutes the first pantheon. Archaeological evidence shows that Upper Egypt experienced various totems, that is a scorpion, then a bull, and back to a scorpion, before the totem shifts to a name of a person, Minis, Narmer, in other words, that's the other name for Minis. And in this developing city-state, the power once held by the totem came to rest in the form of a political and military ruler, Menes. Lower Egypt went through a similar process of unification under various totemic symbols. The falcon is remembered today as Horus. The crocodile is another symbol that shows up somewhere between 5,000 and 3,000 BCE in Lower Egypt. These totems are attested to in the iconography of what we call the proto-dynastic rulers of Lower Egypt. Then around 3100 BCE, Menes unifies Upper and Lower Egypt. The two confederations become one. The effect of this unification is that the symbolic and political importance of these totems, better still to now begin to think of these as gods, gets relocated into individual human persons. And we come to know these first god persons or person gods with the name Pharaoh. Different ethnic communities continued to maintain allegiance to and worship of their respective totems, yet the symbolic and material worlds came together in the body of Pharaoh. In the person of Minis and subsequent Pharaohs, the Western world is introduced to the idea of what we call an anthropomorphic and agential god. Anthropomorphic here referring to moments when we attribute human-like qualities to non-human objects or animals, or in this case, deities. God and person, imago Dei, imago humando, which is which, which came first, becomes murky at this point. There's a, a truth claim, as made by believers, that God set all of this in motion. And then there's a scientific or historical perspective, which holds that even God has a history, and this is one way of telling that history. The highest anthropomorphism is that of attributing to God the idea of agency, agency in being, to be specific. But these are the first Western gods, and they had human qualities because they were made in the image of Pharaoh. That is, they have human qualities because 
They are human. The first truly powerful God in the world is a man. Now, this is the thread of the story most pertinent to my broader focus, but a slight detour helps flesh out the other origin story for the idea of God. So around the same time that Upper and Lower Egypt are unifying, another couple of confederations are slowly unifying as well in Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in what is today Syria and Iraq. These are the Sumerian and Akkadian civilizations. The Akkadian people initially followed a totemic social structure very similar to the Egyptians. As a result, the Akkadian pantheon of gods came to look very similar to the Egyptian pantheon. However, the Sumerians are altogether different. They did not organize themselves totemically. In fact, we do not really know where they came from because we struggle to track them in the archaeological record. This has led to what some scholars call the Sumerian problem, and it's also the open question within the academic world that enables all sorts of conspiracy theories, big and small, to fill in that, that gap, that knowledge gap. We simply don't know. The Sumerians are as likely to have been just an, uh, a strange human community that rose to power, or they could have come from on high. We do not know where they came from or how their mythology developed, although we do know a lot about their mythology, which is yet another conundrum within that Sumerian problem. Many of you might know this, but the Sumerians gave the Western world the very first symbolic representation of God. We call it the Dinger, or I call it the Dinger. I'll put a, an image of it right here. The Sumerians worshipped a sky god as well called An, believing that as a people they emerged from workers or angels of the sky god called, you guessed it, the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki have come to be part of contemporary popular culture because some have suggested that the Sumerian origin story is the origin story of all of humanity. According to this line of argument, we humans all came from some ancient alien race whose angels, the Anunnaki, created us as a slave race. Now, I want to make clear, we do not have evidence to support these claims, not evidence that is compelling. We have evidence that is tantalizing, but not compelling. And I, I'm a fan. Back behind me is, a sign, is the, the X-Files poster that says, I want to believe, I do. I'm compelled by stories of ancient aliens. It's not only interesting, but it's fun. And I, I like to think in those terms, but we don't have hard evidence to support those claims. What we can conclude, I think, is just as fascinating. In the Sumerian effort to document and archive their origin story, that is to write it down, they gave us another Western origin account of the idea of God that of an abstract or symbolic authority. The dinger is the first written symbol marking that abstract understanding of God. This is the history of where the idea that God is everything or that God is uh, nothing, God is infinite, God is eternal, God is in the stars. This is where that abstract representation first emerges also. I think that is miraculous. From what we know, of these Egyptian and Mesopotamian cultures, we can develop a portrait of the past that suggests God, for Westerners then, is about 5,000 years old and is expressed in these two ways. First, in the anthropomorphism, emerging as Pharaoh. Is it, have you ever wondered why we don't just call them kings? This is why. They represent more than king. And second, through symbolic representation. Now, the history of God, as it matters for our conversation, picks up more forcefully again in Egypt. You might wonder why. Well, because Egypt shows up in the biblical record. As many scholars contend, what we come to understand as monotheism, that is the worship of one God and the prohibitions of belief in any other gods, first appears in Egypt under Amenhotep IV, around 1340 BCE who began worshiping a singular god to the exclusion of the rest of the Egyptian pantheon. Now, Amenhotep IV attempted a brief political and religious revolution, which included changing his own name to Akhenaten in homage to the high god Aten. This revolution was short-lived, and upon his death, Egypt went back to understanding Pharaoh as the literal and figurative seat of power. 
what we generally regard as biblical monotheism emerges again connected to Egypt, but this time in the form of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt under the protection of the god Yahweh. Yahweh is one of many deities in a pantheon of deities, each associated with various tribes. And like them, Yahweh eventually comes together in different city-states and social contexts because different kinds of people are coming together bringing their gods with them. It makes you wonder how so many people use the Bible to argue that they know what God wants for us when there's not even one God in that Bible. But I digress. So to conclude this quick history lesson, in the Bible there is this idea we call the Imago Dei, that humans are made in the image of God. Well, if we look at history and archaeology, we see a kind of reversal. Humans may not be made in the image of God, but God comes to be made in the image of humans, specifically in the image of Pharaoh with all of the human attributes, as well as the divine attributes of being, all-powerful, all-knowing, and more. We'll talk more about that as we move into the third and fourth key concepts for this course, so stick around.